This is a continuation of a story about a band camp I attended in 1980. You can find part one in the description. Later that day, I heard a story that Sean and another friend of his were in the dormitory. He had a tennis ball and record in his hand, and he claimed to have heard a voice tell him to throw the ball at his friend. He hesitated for a moment and then served the ball right at him with all his might. Fortunately, it just missed him. He excused this action by claiming that he couldn't control himself. At dinner that evening, he was looking flushed and his hands were shaking. Whenever he looked at me, he would just shake his head. During practice, I noticed that he was looking at everyone in a very strange way and his face was white. Many people noticed this and even remarked on it. Afterwards, he walked up to me and said there was going to be another seance that night and I had to come to it. I said no, I wouldn't. I had finally and probably belatedly decided that enough was enough. It had been interesting and fun at first, but now I was starting to feel like I was in over my head. So me and a couple of other people decided that we should see one of the Christian brothers that lived there on the campus. So we went to visit one of them and we ended up having a very long talk with him. He suggested that it could be some kind of mental telepathy and said that you should assume that there are no evil spirits around until you proved that there were. Of course, I'm not really sure what he meant by prove and I also found it ironic he would talk about telepathy of all things and at the same time suggest that there were no spirits. He also said that if I really felt the need for protection, I could make an imaginary cross and call for God's help. After a long talk, we decided to do what he suggested. We went to the stairs and felt that the energy was there, though not as strong as it had been. I made my cross, said the Lord's Prayer and asked for help. The presence then left and did not return until the final days of the camp and then only very weakly. Now you would have thought that this would be the end of it all, but you'd be wrong. The next day, we went swimming to a local pool as it was a very hot summer's day. Everyone was throwing a tennis ball around to each other. Sean got hold of it and threw it right at me. He managed to hit the side of my face, though being a tennis ball, it didn't actually do any damage. I was still shocked though. Later he told me that he didn't want to throw it at me and that he couldn't even throw straight. He said that every time he looked at me, he would hear a voice saying, get him, and he was being instructed to stay close to me. Later on, he told me that he was going to have the seance that night and that I must come to it. I said I wouldn't, but he seemed confident that I would come. But then, Somebody mentioned that if you said the Lord's Prayer backwards while looking in a mirror, you would see the devil. Well, this was too much for Sean to resist doing, and so, before he planned to have the seance, he took a group of people down to the shower area, and he had somebody read the words to him while he repeated them back as he was looking in the mirror. I stayed away no longer wishing to be part of this. If I had gone, I might have witnessed what many others said they saw happen. He said the first five words, then his cheeks went white and his eyes went red, taking on a glow. I noticed when everybody came up the stairs, they all had bloodshot eyes and they looked exhausted and drained. However, for some apparent reason, this wasn't enough for Sean and so he decided to go downstairs again and do it a second time and this time he had his friend Terry join him. 
Sean told me later that he saw his hair, which was blonde, go dark, and his eyes appeared to glow, and Terry said that he saw a shadow pass over his face. They both claimed to have gone into a trance. They said they could hear themselves speaking, but they couldn't feel themselves doing it. Interestingly enough, Sean chose not to have the seance. He said, ironically, he felt it was too dangerous. That night, we were once again swarmed by those black beetles. No clue how they got into the rooms as all the windows were closed. And oddly enough, all the bugs fell on Sean and Terry's bed, but missed mine. They even bit Terry three times and they were also crawling towards Sean and biting him. These bugs did not bite, to the best of my knowledge. I heard a voice in my mind say, they won't get you because you didn't attend the Lord's Prayer in the mirror business. This time the bugs were also swarming in the shower area where they had done the prayer, and soon there was a carpet of crunchy black beetles lying dead on the floor. It was at this point that I found someone named Glenn had a cross on a necklace, so I asked if I could borrow it. He agreed, as I was starting to fear that what I was facing was the devil, and I hoped it would help protect me. The bugs kept on crawling towards Sean, so I decided to give him the cross to see if it would help. The bugs did indeed stop crawling towards him, and they stopped attacking him. Sean then told me he was hearing a voice in his mind saying that it was going to get me. I denied that it would, but he insisted that it would. The following morning, Sean took off the cross and said that he didn't need it anymore. I put the cross back on around myself and felt that it did indeed give me some protection. And for the first time in a while, it was a quiet day and I was hopeful that whatever had been happening was finally over. The next morning, as I was going down the stairs, I noticed that the chain that the cross was on felt hot around my neck. It was a very odd sensation. Sean told me that every time he saw the cross, he had the urge to get me to take it off. Indeed, he insisted that I should take it off. Every time I went down the stairs, I felt the chain get heavy, and the urge to take it off came over me. I nearly did so once, but thought better of it. A bit later on, back up the stairs, I was walking with Sean towards the door on the other side of the room, when they opened for him. We walked through, and they closed behind us. I asked, how did he do that? As I felt no wind, he said he didn't know. He was just thinking, wouldn't it be good if the doors opened, and they did. The next day, the temptation to take off the cross was so strong that I actually felt uncomfortable wearing it. That night, Sean was trying to make me take it off again, and I was refusing, as usual, when suddenly he doubled up in what he said was agonizing pain. The thought that I should give the cross to him entered my mind, so I asked him if he wanted me to give it to him, and he said yes. I almost did, but decided against it at the last moment. With that choice, the pain abruptly stopped. I then asked him if he would have worn it, and he said no, moods change, but he wouldn't have given it back to me either. Things once again became quiet after that for a short while. As I wore the cross, I felt protected. The camp went on and was coming to an end. It was only two weeks, but I felt like two very long weeks. And even though I wasn't a Christian, the cross seemed to give protection to me and prevented things from happening. The band camp had finally come to an end and on the last day we were all clearing up after ourselves, and I found myself, ironically, being told to sweep the stairs with Sean. We discussed what had happened, and I asked him about the voice he had heard, 
I was curious about it and if I could talk to it because I wanted to ask some questions and Sean agreed. My first question was, was it Robert Rice that died there? And the answer was he didn't, nor were his ashes upstairs. I then asked if this was the devil. The answer was yes. I believed that he had already tried to get me at one point, so I asked if he had indeed tried to do that. The answer was yes, he had, and he was trying to get me now. So I asked, why me? He had answered that it had failed before, and it didn't like failing, and it was trying to possess me. I once again asked, why me? And I was told that I was more vulnerable than other people, and I expected him to get me. He had also said that it had posed as my subconscious mind, and was pretending to be something that was helpful. I asked it if it was after anybody else at the camp, but it said it was only me. With what I know now, there are beings who could pass as the devil, and who have taken on their title. Now I don't believe in the biblical version of the devil, but from experience, there are definitely beings out there who could certainly fill that role. I am also certain from other experiences that I've had, that indeed this devil had a vested interest in trying to remove me. That's a story for another day though. My next question was about the pressure we had felt in the stairs. What was it? He said it was trying to frighten us and having the seance was a really stupid thing to do. I asked what it was trying to do to Sean when he said the Lord's Prayer backwards. The answer was that it was trying to possess him. I asked if it had succeeded, but he said no, because he had not done it long enough. He said that he had possessed many people, but they didn't know it. They just thought they had a bad temper. To me, this sounds like what people refer to as Legion. And I've had personal experiences with Legion. Then I asked if I was interfering with him and if I was a danger to him. He said yes, and I was. He told me that the cross gave me some protection, and so did asking for God's help, but an imaginary cross was not powerful enough, and I couldn't ask for God's help all the time, and I was most vulnerable when I was asleep. It had decided to use the staircase because I had to use it to get to the bathroom. It had taken over Sean because he was my friend and was using him as a stepping stone to get to me. It also said that it had blown out the lights in the staircase. My mistake had been leaving Sean on the stairway at the time and telling him about my experiences which left him open to such things. I asked him a few more questions but all Sean was now getting was stop it you bastard. I stopped and Sean came back. He told me that at first he had let me talk to this thing that was in his mind, but after a few questions he lost control and it sounded like two people having a conversation. He also couldn't remember any of what had been said, something I found out later was typical of someone who channels. He also said that sometimes he was reluctant to answer my questions because he felt he was lying. It's hard to know what was true and what was not true, but I suspect the truth lies somewhere in between. The camp ended shortly afterwards and I went home with a sense of wonder that such things could actually happen. I told several of my friends about it, but few were really interested in my story apart from the fact that it made a good ghost story. Sean, however, was never the same after that camp. He became the bane of all my future camp experiences, of which there were three of them. And when I'd see him at solo competitions, he would just stand there with his friend Terry, staring and laughing at me, like an early version of Beavers and Butthead. It was almost as though he had made it his mission to make sure my time around him was as unpleasant as possible, 
and he did a good job of that. But fortunately, I had started to come into my own and had much better protection. I also heard he was messing around with the occult when he was at home. This incident itself is isolated. Nothing similar occurred on future camps. For that I was grateful, though at the same time somewhat disappointed. There's an allure you have when you're too young to know about the supernatural, especially the dark side of it. Part of you doesn't really believe it's true, and the other part wants to believe, and while that was the only camp where such things happened, it was by no means the only event of that nature that happened in my life. I recall it with such vivid detail because when I got home from the camp, I wrote everything down verbatim in a five-page document. And during that time, the light bulb in my room blew four times. So this story is exactly as I remembered it. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you want to hear more, please let me know in the comment section. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, here are some others you might find interesting. If you have any thoughts, I'd love to hear about them. Leave a comment and maybe even a like. I rise like a phoenix.